What I want to talk a little bit about is David did ask me to try and say something different. So guess what? I'm in marketing. I'm not going to show you any adverts. I'm not going to tell you about our brand scores. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about competition and perhaps a slightly different way of thinking about some of this stuff. So competition. Do we all know that gag? Two guys walking across the Serengeti plain and the lion is behind them, stalking them. And one of them starts putting his trainers on and he says, you'll never outrun the lion. He says, nah, he's got to outrun you. <laughs> is that what competition's become in banking? As long as we're not the ones getting mauled, as long as we're not the ones being chewed by the lion, we're OK. It was a good day in the office. And actually, I think my previous speaker was sort of alluding to this a little bit. It's kind of probably not good enough. Because actually, when you get a competitor who changes the spirit and the kind of nature of competition, you get this kind of stuff. Sadly, another bloody Scotsman, and I've got my <laughs> colleague, Mr. Keir, here. But nonetheless, Chris Hoy is a fantastic <laughs> icon for competitiveness. And probably without Chris Hoy, and actually Dave Brailsford, the endless accumulation of small advantages, if you're interested in cycling as a sport, you don't get all of those other people on the podium at the last Olympics, kind of competing with his manner in which he took a sport to a new level. So isn't this what we need? Because actually without it, we're just waiting for the lion, aren't we? We're waiting to get the regulator, the government, the media, whoever else is going to come after us, and in some instances quite rightly come after us, to actually basically give us a good chewing. So my plea here is how do we get more Chris Hoy into what we do and less trainers on the Serengeti plain? Because I think for us as an industry, we've got to start thinking a little bit differently. So the heart of our customers is really the turf war here. There are lots of other places in banks where we have to be mindful of how we compete, whether it's our balance sheets, whether it's our Basel III, you know, um, opaque kind of regulatory frameworks we'll all have to comply with to be competitive and in the market. But it's the heart of those customers that I think I make a plea for today for us to at least pay a little bit of attention to. So one of the things I'd like us to just think about a little bit is it's not trying to understand what they think, because we can do lots of that. We can run lots of surveys. One of the things that I think is important is we need to understand a bit better about how they think. And one of the things we've been doing some work on at HSBC is some of this behavioral economics. There was an occasional paper by the FCA. There's been a lot of talk about all of this. In fact, actually, Alan and I were doing some stuff with a, one of the senior ex-co's in the bank a little while ago on this very subject area, just to get some folks to try and think a little bit differently about how customers use the cues they have, of which brand is a really important one. But there are other things. And it's in this whole management of brand that we now have to start to look at how they approach our category how they approach our products and services. And actually, at the end of the day, I think one of the things that's important is we don't think as much as we think we think. So this is a little bit of work that we've done with a company called Brainjuice. So I'm stealing some of their charts just to see whether or not this chimes with any of you. I'm not saying I'm definitively right, or we've got a view. But the human brain is a peculiar thing. Obviously very complex, very difficult to understand. I'm not saying I've got any great insights into it particularly. But this is from somebody else's very good work. So in the spirit of standing on the shoulders of giants, let me take you through a couple of little exercises for you to see that actually there's a very important part of our brain that in a book called Thinking Fast and Slow, a man called Daniel Kahneman, the only ever psychologist to win an economics Nobel Prize, he talks about what they call system one and system two thinking. System one is your intuitive brain, all the things you use that are simple cues to get you to simple pieces of logic, simple things you can make decisions around. And system two is about saying, give me a bit of paper, I'm going to need to work this out. Okay? So system one and system two operate in very different ways. And we use them in very different ways, but we use them quite, particularly system one, we use it very fast. And in fact, actually, in things like a supermarket is a very good example, and lemons are a very good example. So if it says three lemons for a pound, and you've come in for one lemon, you'll put three in a bag. Because you don't know really whether you get charged 50p for the one at the till or whether or not it's three, but it doesn't really matter that much. Not much risk in it. I'll put three in a bag. That's a piece of behavioral economic theory that says system, two, system one is in operation. Someone sort of told me to buy three lemons. It doesn't really matter. Let me try another little puzzle on you. There you go. A bat and ball costs one pound ten p or one dollar ten cents. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Now, you're all probably very clever and you probably got it right. 
But quite a lot of you might have found an intuitive moment where you said, oh, it's a pound and ten. No, it's not. Because, of course, it isn't. But our brain tells us that that's the easiest answer to find. But the way the question is worded, if you put system two thinking in, you'll get 105 and 5, of course. But actually, at the end of the day, your system one brain immediately probably gave you a pound and 10p. But you possibly, if you're clever enough, probably thought, well, that's probably not right, because it isn't, when you go back and check it. So essentially, that's part of how people use intuitive judgment. And we actually have a very reptilian sort of brain as well as, as animals. And actually, in this, one of the things I'll do to trigger your reptile brain, although this may work, may doesn't, doesn't work with everybody. How honest you all are is another good thing too. Is actually what you can then see. So this is a piece of motion that triggers a piece of your reptile brain. Okay? Don't know what you can see there. You might be able to see something. You might be able to see nothing. Your reptile brain works on some very fundamental, simple triggers like motion. So when I press that, should work. Oh, not oh, end. Hang on. Can I go back, please? My chops. Maybe it works. Doesn't that work? No, let me try. No, it's not going to do it. Never mind. Apologies for that technical glitch. Um, what actually happens is those dots move, and they move in a pattern that looks like someone walking, and your brain will trigger that. So apologies for that. That should have worked, but didn't. What we've done is some work at the bank with a company called Brain Juicer who have something called Face Trace. Face Trace is a very simple way of looking at the autonomic responses that human faces have to stimulus. There's one universal positive one, which is happy which is the same in every stimulation of happiness. You win the national lottery or you have your favorite tea, when you get home tonight, the happiness face is the same face. When your children give you a beautifully kind of crafted Valentine's card, your happiness face is the same happiness face. Other autonomic responses require much more complex <coughs> response from you as an animal. So actually some of those other ones you can see there, sadness, contempt, surprise, anger, disgust, fear, all of those have different levels of response. We do codify surprise as being a kind of net positive in this. And what this is about doing is trying to understand how someone feels about something that's just happened to them. And so what we did with this piece of work a few years ago was we went into our branch networks to try and start to understand what people felt about having been to HSBC to get something done. And what it did was it didn't ask them to go and use System 2 Brain, where you sit down and you say, here is a bunch of market research questions, and how do I scale them? And actually, most of the time, they didn't have the time to do it. So what we ended up doing was doing something very simple. We used a kiosk, but we were looking at whether or not we could run this on a variety of different platforms. We garden walled it outside of the bank's IT system. We asked you to go up and do three simple things. Tell us how you felt about the experience, what kind of customer you were. Were you one of our premier customers, our what's called advanced customers, one of our banking customers or business customer? And what had you come in to get done today? It literally took you 15 seconds to do it. We did allow you an open-ended thing if you wanted to say anything at the end of it all. And what this started doing was starting to help us understand a little bit about some of the things that people face when dealing with banks and starting to understand a little bit better about how people felt at different situations where the bank is there to either help them or not. So actually start to really get an emotional response to our things. We use this for ad testing, but this was something we used for service testing. This is a very interesting set of charts. It's very complicated. I apologize for that. But one of the things that's really important, and the psychologists got onto this in a second at Brain Juice, so they're <coughs> essentially psychology academics. One of the things that's on here that's really interesting is if you look across here, these are all of the different things. Now, luckily, quite a lot of them are happiness ones. But to that extent, I think, you know, my colleague from Tesco just now mentioned the fact that actually transactionally we're quite good. So if you come in, you get done what you get done, you'll get happy as you walk out the door. It's fine. So a lot of the time it is positive. But when it's not, and particularly obviously making a complaint was never going to be positive, but for some people it was because they possibly got listened to. But one of the things that was very interesting here was, for instance, in coming in for a mortgage quote, we got <coughs> contempt, which is the highest order of negativity. And one of the things that the psychologists were very interested in was a contempt is based on you judging me as a person and my ability to look after my family. <laughs> so actually what we were now starting to understand is negativity has an important understanding about how we might choose to turn you down for a mortgage quote. So maybe it's not computer says no, maybe it's no, well maybe it's yes or maybe. Maybe we need to talk to you about how much you're trying to borrow here, Mr. Clark, because actually at the end of the day, it's possibly not good for you that you want to borrow this much money. 
So actually, at the end of the day, what we've got to do here is learn a little bit more about the impact we have on people. Interestingly, travel money was very simple things, such as, you know, sadness, which is just uh, it's inconvenient. You buggered up me travel money. Me Turkish lira didn't show up at the branch. As you said, I'm going to have to go to Thomas Cook at Stansted Airport. What a pain in the bum. It's slightly different to being turned down for a mortgage that your wife has sent you in there or your husband sent you in there to go and get this mortgage sorted out because we love that flat. We love that little terraced house. And now I say to you, no, we're not going to give it to you. It's an awful personal moment. And we as an industry have to understand some of this sort of interactions a bit better. And a lot of this can take place equally in the digital channels as it can in the face-to-face -face channels. But this was stuff we were doing for branches just to get some learning. Some of the things we did actually ask for was some feedback from customers generally. And generally, banks are quite scary places potentially. So fear had some of these kinds of things. Actually, someone was clearly walking into the branch. and We didn't ask them to tell us who they were. And we didn't want to go and chase them down afterwards. But we were looking for verbatim comments from customers about how they felt at some of these moments. And fear got everything from bank may repossess my house. So maybe they're behind on their payments. How do we start to understand how to manage those things? And by the way, I do believe that banks have a right to be able to do things that allow them to repossess people's homes or to foreclose on businesses. We take your deposits and we put them in a place and we take those deposits and we lend them to somebody else. That's the banking system. And as a deposit holder, you wouldn't like the idea that we w turned around to you and said awfully sorry about your deposits. They were such nice chaps who started that small business or had that house that couldn't pay the mortgage on. We're not going to ask them for the money back, so you're going to have to suffer as a deposit holder. That is completely unacceptable within banking. And therefore, as a business, whilst we can look at the way in which perhaps a great retailer like Tesco does business, we have to understand there's some hard bits of our business that do impact customers. But it is a reality of banking. It is not something that you can move away from the equation. How much you put it front and centre is another thing altogether. Importantly also, some of these other ones, I'm not going to go through these in great deal of detail, but Contempt had a whole load of things. We had some music in our branches at one stage, a variety of different things that were there they didn't like. What we found with Disgust was lots of little things that irritate people. And I think for many of us, those things in great service businesses are important for us to get right. If you went to a hotel and it was a decent hotel, there was no toiletries in there at all, there was no shampoo, there was no soap, there was only one towel, which are the basics of hoteling, you'd sort of feel the fact it's, you know, poor print out of receipts, all this kind of stuff. We need to make sure that what we are doing is paying attention to some of the simple hygiene factors as well when we serve our customers. One of the other things we did discover, and this is just one branch, was we have some very powerful leaders. And actually what happened here was in week four, the branch manager was on a two week holiday and he was a terrible delegator. He had nobody in his branch who used to take over from him in any effective kind of way. He was actually very good. He used to walk around the back and tell folks, stop eating your sandwich, would you mind going back out the front please? But when he was away, that didn't happen. And so equally understanding actually the roles of some of our leadership in this. So we learned a great deal from all of this. Did we apply all of it? No. But nonetheless, I think it's beholden on us as an industry to learn a little bit more about the impact we have on people and can have on people. We talked earlier about whether or not brands are ever as kind of interesting in financial services as Apple. Well, they're not. But the things we deal with are, whether it's your home, your children's education, your retirement, whilst they're not as sexy, they're much more important. If I said to you, you can have a really nice retirement or an iPod, you can have a really nice home or an iPod. You can have a really good education for your children or an iPod, right? It's not much of a contest. And a bank is a facilitator of those things. And of course, it, you wouldn't ever look to put those two things side by side and make that choice. But we have to start to understand a little bit better about how important we are. As a colleague of ours at HSBC often says that banking is the second most important thing in the world after healthcare. Sort of maybe it is actually. I'm never sure whether I do believe him, but there's a part of me when you think about it in that context of the role we play in customers' lives, whether they're business customers or personal customers, it's quite important that we get it right, that we look after their interests, that when they give us their money, they have access to it, they can use it for the things that are important to them, they can make it grow. And each of those things, I think, is a very important part of putting the customer back into that Chris Hoy moment for us. So. 
when we actually leave the room as a bank for the service, for our culture, for all of those other good things, as well as that bit of marketing and advertising, what do we want said when we leave the room? What sort of things do we want said about ourselves? Because one of the things that may be a small unintended consequence, that little bit of the brain that sits in the middle there that uses that system one intuition is actually taking over a bit in banking because I don't really understand it anymore. System two, my logical bit, has become too hard. So now when I go and look for an investment product, a simple ISA, I'll look for, do I trust your brand? Do I know you as a relationship manager? My brother-in-law says I should get one of these. And then you put it in front of me and you say, your risk appetite scores four. What's that mean? And the asset allocation shows me the following things. I'm lost. So what we've now got as an unintended consequence, perhaps, between the regulation and the way in which we've manufactured our products is actually made our customers rely a bit too much on system one and not enough on system two. So conduct risk and all those other things we face as an industry is an important part of now trying to understand that the way in which behavioral economics and those sorts of things can help us understand why people think the way they do may help us a little bit. I don't think we're served well by having our customers not understand financial services products properly. And perhaps there is a movement required to make sure that there is a system two moment when you buy something where we do our best at least to say, please, you do understand this, don't you? In the customer's language, not in a risk appetite of four and an asset allocation model of X, Y, Z, which loses very many of them, including probably myself half the time, if I'm honest. And that's a terrible admission to make. But let's ensure, perhaps in the future, that our competitive stance is much more around how we understand that it's not about whether or not we can outrun the lion so that the other guy gets chewed, and more about how we put the customer at the heart of what we do as an industry and do our best to make sure we serve them better. That's all I was going to say. Thank you.